Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to just wait one second so that people can get logged in, and then we're going to get started with the webinar. And if you can hear me, can you please use the raised hand function? I see those coming in. Thank you so much, everybody. Perfect. So we are going to get started. My name is Clay Kingsbury. I'm a senior program associate at QuestBridge, and I also happen to be a QuestBridge alum, and I'm very excited to be moderating today's panel. Thank you for joining us for what is the last of a three-part webinar series called Meet Our Colleges, where, well, you'll get to do just that. You'll learn more about some of our colleges and different aspects that make each of them distinct. Today's webinar is all about the consortium experience. We are joined by admissions representatives from three of our college partners that are part of a consortium or partnership with other institutions. So if you want to know what it's like to attend one school with access to many others, or you already know that you want a cross-campus experience for college, then you're in the right place. I have a couple of prepared questions for our panel, but please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A feature of Zoom. Our panelists may answer some of them while we chat, and I'll also ask them some of them as we go along. And at the end is when we're really going to dive into the dedicated uh, student Q&A. Please note, we may not be able to answer every single question. So, so feel free to email us at questions at questbridge.org with questions about the application or the QuestBridge process, and reach out to our college partners directly for any school-specific questions you may have. So to get started, I'm going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves and introduce the institutions that they are representing. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Grove. I use he, him pronouns. I am an admission counselor on the diversity outreach team of Amherst College. Um, for those of you who don't know, Amherst College is a small liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts. Uh, we are a part of a consortium called the Five College Consortium, which includes Mount Holyoke College, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, which is a big research school. Mount Holyoke is uh, all women's uh, small liberal arts college. Hampshire College, which is kind of like a uh, more liberal out there, uh, experimental liberal arts college that was founded in the 70s. And then Smith College, which is also a QuestBridge partner um, that is the largest uh, historically women's college in the country. Hi, everyone. Such a pleasure to be joining you. My name is Ruby Bhattacharya. I am the Director of Admissions at Barnard College in New York City. Uh, Barnard College is a liberal arts and science college for women uh, in partnership with Columbia University. So we are a college of about 2,700, just under 3,000 students so on the smaller end, but housed under the umbrella of Columbia University. And so Barnard students are able to take classes at Columbia. Columbia students are able to take classes at Barnard. We have a lot of shared resources, clubs, activities, dining halls. Um, athletics are also shared and so happy to go more in depth about that, but that is a little bit about Barnard in New York City. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Morrison, Associate Dean for Diversity and Strategic Initiatives at Claremont McKenna College. Uh, we are located in Southern California, about 36 miles east of Los Angeles. And so in the suburbs uh, of Los Angeles, uh, we are a small uh, liberal arts institution. And so we have just over 1,300 students on our campus. Uh, we are a part of a consortium uh, called the Claremont Colleges. Uh, and we affectionately call the five undergraduate institutions in that, the, the five C's. Uh, and so included in that is uh, Pomona uh, College, which is a QuestBridge uh, partner, uh, Scripps College, which is also a QuestBridge partner, uh, Harvey Mudd uh, College, as well as Pitzer uh, College. And so there's definitely a bunch of resources um, I'm excited to share with you all. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves and the institutions you represent, as well as introducing the other schools in your consortium and partnership. And to kick off the panel, the first question that I have for all of you is, I think it'd be really helpful for students if we defined some vocabulary and terms. So I think it'd be really great if we talked about what exactly a consortium or partnership is, and what does that mean specifically for your institution, and how does your institution operate in that consortium or partnership? And to kick off, Jerry, do you mind starting us off? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think simply 
a, a consortium uh, typically are uh, individual uh, institutions. Uh, and so they're individual, they have their own mission, they have their own focuses, um, but yet they they partner. Uh, and in a lot of cases, in some cases, may share space um, and also resources uh, that are beneficial to um, their students. And so, for example, uh, with the five C's, uh, we definitely uh, share space. Uh, we all kind of sit on uh, almost one mile block uh, together. And so literally, if you cross the street one way from CMC, you're on Pomona's campus, you cross the street the other way, you're on uh, Scripps or Pitzer's uh, campus and just a little bit further down a block uh, wise is Harvey Mudd's uh, campus. Uh, and so we share space, but then we also share, uh, you know, some resources that are beneficial as well. And so just a, a few quick ones off the top of my head are, you know, our library, uh, also some of our affinity uh, spaces, such as our Chicano La uh, Latino Student Association and our Office of Black uh, Students Association uh, as well, which we share as a 5C resource. And so it's two se it's separate institutions that share space and resources. Nathan, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah. So um, for, for Amherst and the five college consortium, we're geographically a little bit more spread out. So for us, what a consortium means is that students are free to take any classes and participate in any extracurriculars or events across any of the five colleges if they're enrolled in one of them. So uh, UMass students can take classes at Amherst, Amherst students can take classes at Smith, so on. Um, the only limitations to that are that we do not share varsity sports. So um, if you're playing varsity sports, you're on our campus. Um, and because we're a little bit geographically separated, you can technically walk to UMass campus from Amherst College uh, because the University of Massachusetts is so big. If you're going to one building, that might be a 10 minute walk. If you're going to another building, it might be a 25 minute walk. Uh, so there is a free bus service in for all students um, in the area that can get you to your classes and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's about uh, social life and then about classes and academics. And then last but certainly not least, Ruby, can you talk about Barnard? Sure. And so the Barnard and Columbia relationship is a particularly unique one. It's born out of the history between Barnard and Columbia, uh, that from uh, Columbia's founding all the way through about 1983, um, women could not apply to Columbia University. And thus, that is how Barnard was created in 1889 uh, to provide women with the opportunity to attain uh, higher education within New York City. And so um, for a while, you had the relationship where you had men at Columbia and women at Barnard, and that's the way that it was. When Columbia University became a co-ed institution, it certainly raised questions of, well, what happens to Barnard? Um, but Barnard, we chose to remain a women's college. We're very, very secure in that identity. And so we exist as two colleges that are literally across the street from one another. Um, but as you see from our logo, we are still Barnard College of Columbia University. We function as one of the four undergraduate colleges within the umbrella of Columbia University. And that means for our students today that there are a lot of resources shared, including classes. So students have access to about 7,000 different Different classes. Uh, one of the major things that is shared is also athletics. Barnard students actually compete on the Columbia sports teams. We're the only women's college in Division I sports because of that. And so, yes, we are a small liberal arts college, but we compete at the Division I level within the Ivy League because of our relationship with Columbia. In proximity, as I mentioned, we're literally across the street. And so, so many resources are intertwined. Students can eat in any of the dining halls. They can study in any of the libraries. Uh, there are over 500 different clubs and organizations that are shared. So our students are very active on both campuses campuses. Additionally, our students are even sharing graduations. Barnard students participate in the Columbia University commencement exercises too, and their degree reads that they are graduating from Barnard College of Columbia University. We have different curricula, but we share a lot of resources, and so our students are very much benefiting from the small college experience, but also the big university, literally across the street, and a Questbridge partner. That is fantastic. And I think it's really great to hear from all three of you how consortiums can operate differently, but also have some commonalities between these three different sets of consortiums and partnerships, especially thinking about locations. Some of them are very close, as the two examples we talked about, and others have a little bit more space. But that doesn't mean that students don't have as much access to resources. So the next question that I have for all of you is, and each of you have already started to address this, 
is what are some of the benefits of attending a school that is a part of a consortium or partnership? Are there special academic programs that students will have access to? Are there additional volunteer opportunities? Are there more unique ways that students can interact than they would not be able to if they weren't a part of a system like this? What are some of the benefits of why our students should consider attending an institution that is a part of a consortium or a partnership? And to start this off, uh, Nathan, do you mind kicking us off? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there are there are a lot of a lot of benefits of being a part of a consortium. And I think really uh, the biggest one is just being able to break kind of out of the the mold of your own specific college. That if you're if you're going to a college like Amherst College, you probably want a small liberal arts college. We have about 1,900 students. You want small class sizes, um, but maybe two years in, you want to try something different, or you are it's almost impossible to be anonymous on our campus and you just wanna go somewhere where you can sit in a class and nobody knows your name. Um, you can do experiment with all sorts of things. Um, all of our schools are very different. A lot of us are small liberal arts colleges, but Smith and Mount Holyoke are both women's colleges. Um, anyone of any gender can take a class to the five college consortium at Smith and Mount Holyoke. Um, but it's something that is a very, very different vibe than um, if you were taking a class at Amherst College. Hampshire College uh, does not have majors and does not give out grades, which is also a very different vibe that attracts a very different type of student. So going and taking a class there, they have like an excellent creative writing program. Um, it's a very different feeling than taking a class at Amherst. And then the University of Massachusetts at Amherst is a huge uh, like flagship school for the entire University of Massachusetts system. They have uh, like 25,000 undergraduate students, massive lecture halls. They have one of the best dining halls in the entire country. They're ranked number one right now, I think. Um, so you get to experience all sorts of different different classrooms that you wouldn't get to experience otherwise if you were just on a 1900 student college campus. Uh, we also offer something called the Five College Certificate Program, which is a series of about 12 certificates that function kind of like minor. Amherst College does not have minor um, because we have an open curriculum and for various reasons it would be very easy to complete minors if we just had them on our campus. But you can get these certificates that function as very much a similar thing in areas like international studies, black studies, Latinx studies, things like that through the five college consortium uh, and then those also go on your diploma as well as your major. Jerry or Ruby, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, fill okay. in. And so, um, you know, at, at CMC, uh, I think the benefits with the five college uh, consortium uh, that we have is, you know, of course, the classes. Uh, our students have access to uh, courses that they wouldn't, you know, have access to uh, at CMC. And so they can take uh, those classes at one of the other four uh, colleges. Uh, we do also allow uh, our students to do off-campus majors uh, as well. And so if there is a major that a student is interested in doing at one of the uh, colleges, they can do that major. It's just up to the department at that college to sign off on it. Uh, and, and students are able to, uh, to take an off-campus major uh, as well. Uh, we have what we call 5C clubs. Uh, which are uh, organizations that are made up of all of the five, uh, you know, campus students. And so while you are able to have, you know, your uh, kind of smaller experience at CMC, uh, your network will definitely expand uh, as you're getting involved in clubs and organizations that involve all uh, of the students from the different uh, colleges. Um, all of the colleges, uh, and I think this, you know, it, it seems to be consistent across the board, but you know, with the five C's, we're all very different in, in terms of our missions, uh, in terms of our, our scopes, um, but our students also have varied interests as well. And, and so, you know, uh, at CMC, of course, you're going to get, you know, that pre-professional uh, liberal arts kind of feel. You're really going to get like that emphasis on leadership, but maybe you're really into like social justice and environmental justice as well. And so you can also take those courses at a Pitzer uh, and it's going to fit in very nicely uh, with your curriculum overall and going to allow you to uh, graduate in four years. 
uh, athletics uh, is also a, a shared uh, kind of benefit for our students as well. Uh, we're actually unique in the fact that um, we make up separate athletics teams between the five colleges. And so uh, Claremont, Mudd, and Scripps makes up one team uh, called CMS. Uh, our biggest rivals are uh, Pomona and Pitzer uh, that make up their own uh, team. And so it's a unique situation because uh, you may be sitting in a class with someone you will be competing against, uh, you know, later on that day or on the weekend. Uh, and so that can, uh, it, it's fun, but intense in terms of the rivalry uh, that that brings uh, on uh, our campus. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the most popular thing, I think if you were to poll uh, our students, the most popular thing is 5C dining. Uh, and so just the fact that our students can, you know, use their swipe at any of the dining halls uh, uh, across campus. So I think in total, there's like 14 different dining halls that you can actually, you know, choose to eat at. Uh, and our students have it down to a science. You know, they know that, you know, on, on Sundays, they're gonna get sushi from uh, Scripps. And, you know, on a Tuesday, it might be tacos uh, at CMC. And so uh, they, they find out how to kind of game the system uh, to make the consortium uh, work best for them. Uh, but there, there's so many resources uh, that you have access to uh, due to the relationship. So it really is a benefit that allows you to, again, as Nathan said, kind of break the mold of just, you know, that one college experience. And then Ruby, is there anything that you would like to add for Barnard? Sure. I think academically, our students certainly benefit that there are certainly a lot of classes our students gain access to because of the Barnard Columbia relationship, um, but also majors and minors. So very similar to the way the Claremont Consortium works, where our students are able to pursue academic programs at Columbia and vice versa. Columbia students are pursuing majors that perhaps only exist at Barnard. Things like architecture, urban studies are only at Barnard College. And so there are students from Columbia who are pursuing those at Barnard regardless of their gender identity. So yes, Barnard is a women's college, and, but at the same time, you're going to have students across the gender spectrum in all of the classes at Barnard. And I think that's very surprising to a lot of students. I think people have this perception of what they think a women's college ought to look like or the, what the experience might be. And I love that we challenge that by having the access to this consortium um, and even within our own community, acknowledging that gender is a spectrum and that recognizing that within our community, we have students who are identifying in a lot of different ways. What's happening though, is when a class is at Barnard, because it is inherent to our mission that we are a women's college, it means that the voices and perspectives of women are going to be elevated within the spaces. And so regardless of who is in the class and, and their gender identity, that's really going to be the priority, um, regardless of the subject matter at hand, regardless of who is in the classroom. Um, but certainly the academic benefits for our students are, are immense. Um, socially too, I think for some students, when I mentioned we're a women's college, some students pause when they hear that thinking, is that the experience I'm looking for? But at the same time, I do find that we are a little bit of a different kind of women's college experience because we are housed within a co-ed university. And I think that gives students a very different experience academically, but also socially, knowing that we share dining halls, we share library, we, libraries, we share clubs and activities. And of course, as I mentioned before, Barnard students compete on the Columbia sports teams. And so our students have this best of both worlds approach that you're getting the small liberal arts experience, but you're also getting this D1 athletics experience where if you would like to have, you know, the big game be the focal point of your social life, you absolutely can. Um, but the many of our students are also, you know, proud to be a part of the Barnard Columbia Consortium because they're excited to be in New York City. Um, I think there are a lot of things that students can find within that within the consortium, but also within the city. Thank you all so much for addressing those benefits. And I think it's fantastic that in each consortium or partnership, there are unique academic, athletic, and social benefits for our students. And I think it's really great for our students to hear about those benefits. And I think something that each of you has addressed already is talking about shared resources and how a lot of your institutions are sharing either facilities or offices of support. And I would love to hear more about specific resources that maybe exist in a consortium a partnership that really enable first-generation and low-income students to feel supported during their time in college. So if there are any resources or offices that collaborate to help support those types of students that we work with, I think it'd be really great for our population to hear. And I'm going to open it up to anyone who would like to start, and then we could go around and share some of those unique resources to support students. 
I'm happy to start that at Barnard and Columbia, what I think is particularly special is because we are so intertwined, because there are so many resources that are shared, we actually do a lot of joint orientation. And so um, most of our students will be moving in next week, but the first generation students have already arrived on campus. And we do what we call our new student orientation program, NSOP, and that is happening across Barnard and Columbia. And so there's a lot of programming that is distinctly happening on each individual campus so students can get a feel for their home campus. But at the same time, they are also getting to do to engage with their, their new friends over at Columbia and so literally across the street. So a lot of opportunities to um, really think about orienting an entire community um, to their new neighborhood, to their new home, and really understanding the benefits of the consortium. And I think particularly thinking about how we support first generation and low income students, ensuring that students really know where to go with their questions, who to ask for for help. Um, and there are a lot of shared resources, whether it's thinking about the Barnard Columbia Food Pantry or thinking about um, resources academically or career services. And, you know, at Barnard and Columbia, yes, we have our distinct um, offices on our campuses. At Barnard, we have a resource called Beyond Barnard, but there are a lot of opportunities where there are shared things, whether it's a certain employer is coming to campus to talk about a job opportunity, to talk about internships, and uh, those invitations are typically open to Barnard and Columbia students at the same time. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities to just engage across the community and we do a great job as, as two distinct communities collaborating um, to really support this broader Barnard Columbia community. Yeah, I mean, uh, at CMC, it's, it's similar in, in the fact that uh, each of the institutions have um, organizations uh, focused on, you know, first gen, um, you know, students from low income uh, backgrounds. So focus to support um, those students. But what happens is with the five C's, uh, those organizations collaborate uh, a lot together. And so um, they collaborate in a few different ways. Number one, uh, first they collaborate academically uh, in terms of just educating um, the population on making sure that students know all of the resources that are uh, available to them, whether it's our, you know, quantitative uh, lab or writing resource center um, that students uh, from, you know, the different colleges uh, may be able to tap into uh, on each campus. Um, but then that also goes into the social uh, sphere as well. And, and so, you know, when it comes to uh, holding uh, even something as simple as like a, a, a party or, or a dinner, uh, I know that our one gen uh, organization here at CMC, uh, they actually host a, a first generation college student uh, dinner uh, where it's, you know, set up, but students from any of the other colleges, uh, you know, that identify as first gen, uh, you know, can come and participate uh, in that dinner, come get a plate of food, uh, socialize and, and, and talk uh, as well. And so although we have our separate uh, offices, uh, really made to support like the specific needs uh, of our students and, and our populations. Uh, our offices and departments do collaborate uh, quite a bit um, to make sure that uh, our students are well aware of all of the supports um, that are in place uh, for them on the different uh, campuses. And it's just a, a quick way um, for us to be able to get that information out to um, the students as, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I'll just close this out, I guess, by saying that at, at Amherst, we don't have a whole lot of shared resources in that sense because we're physically separated quite a bit. And also because our campuses are so different, like first gen low income support at University of Massachusetts at Amherst looks very different than it does at Amherst College. So we have a lot of really, really good financial um, and social resources for first gen and low income students. Um, but they're mostly specific to, to our campus. And as with most like extracurricular and things, um, they are free to be accessed by students from other campuses, but typically they're all doing their own thing also that their students are more likely to engage with. Thank you all for addressing that and really talking about the unique advantages and resources that are available to first generation and low income students when they attend a school that is a part of a consortium or a partnership and also how sometimes those resources are coming directly uh, from their home institution and they don't always need to rely on the consortium but there are also those great additional resources that can come from having access to multiple institutions. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of attending these types of institutions and the unique value for students. Um, I think we're going to shift gears a little bit. And the next question that I would love to hear your perspective and your thoughts on is, 
What do you hear students rave about when they talk about engaging across campuses? What do students really enjoy about being a part of a program like this? And to kick us off, Nathan, why don't you start? Yeah, so I think I think for Amherst students, it's mostly a social benefit. Um, I think there, there's definitely an academic benefit in terms of small niche classes. And I've already talked about that a lot. Like I had a friend who grew up um, learning uh, or hearing Cantonese spoken in her household and she could understand it, but couldn't speak it. And Cantonese, well, Amherst has uh, Mandarin Chinese as one of our languages. We don't have Cantonese. Um, but she was able to take lessons over at UMass and was really grateful for that. So there are academic experiences that students find very, very valuable. But I think the main thing that students are just really excited about on a daily basis is social stuff. Um, being able to go to concerts at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst where they have 25,000 undergraduate students. And so if they if they throw a concert and 20% of their student body shows up, that's like double the entire population of Amherst College. And like, it's just a way more fun um, than if you're just, going to a concert at Amherst, which can also be fun, but it's, it's you know, quieter. It's a little bit less rocking. Um, so there's, there's a lot of fun in that. You, if you want to play in a marching band, you can go to UMass because they have a marching band. Um, there's a really good stand-up comedy club at Hampshire where Amherst College does not have one. Um, all of the, or a lot of the Smith students join, Smith does not have sororities, so they join sororities at UMass and then invite people from the entire five college consortium uh, to come to their parties. So it's it's a lot of um, just like social interplay that's happening outside of the classroom and outside of academics that I think students are really excited about and allow them to meet people from very different backgrounds, um, not just on their own campus, but meeting people who have vastly different educational experiences than them um, and are have, coming to college with very different goals and very different ideas of what they want from their educational experience. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I think I already touched on this. Uh, our students rave about the food. Um, that that was their biggest complaint during COVID uh, when, five, when 5C dining was not available. Uh, and I think it's been the thing that they've been uh, most excited about coming back uh, since we've been able to open things back up. And so, um, you know, to, to Nathan's point, I do think it is ultimately like that social experience. Uh, as much as they do get out of all of the academic benefits and like the, I think the freedom and liberty uh, and the variance that they're able to add into their curriculum um, through the benefits of the colleges. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to beat that social uh, aspect of just being able to, you know, get off your campus and, and, and meet uh, other people uh, and expand uh, your, your network, um, whether that's through, you know, a club or whether that's through, uh, you know, research or, or whatever. And so, uh, our students really rave about, you know, just the the ability to socialize with with, with other students. Um, and there's kind of no way around it uh, at CMC. You're just going to be in and around uh, students from the other colleges, uh, whether you're doing a club or or sitting in class. And so that that's big for them. I think between Barnard and Columbia, our students really appreciate having a sense of home within New York City. Um, we both have very distinct campuses. It's not just a collection of buildings or skyscrapers. It truly is, you know, both colleges have a very distinct campus that are right across the street from one another. And so literally just a crosswalk between us. And for our students, I know that they really appreciate the academic opportunities, but also the extracurricular opportunities, whether it's being able to be a part of the Columbia University Spectator, that's the university-wide newspaper, or playing in the Columbia University Orchestra. Uh, but then even for Columbia students, I was just talking to a Columbia student today who was saying that um, how much he's enjoyed the opportunity to take advantage of Barnard classes, but also um, one of his favorite spots to study uh, between the two campuses is the Barnard Library. And so uh, for each student being able to find what feels comfortable to them, whether that's classes of different class sizes. Um, our colleges represented here are, are, are small, and so we have consortium agreements with institutions that might be larger than us, and so some of our students like being able to have that variety of engaging in small classes, but also bigger classes, depending on what works best for them and how a student learns. Uh, so I think for our students being able to, to really customize their experience in many ways and have this, this incredible academic journey that they are really shaping um, because they have access to just so many different resources and opportunities, but for our students, um, 
um, amid the big city being in New York, our students have that sense of home and something very, very, very personal. Thank you all for addressing what students really enjoy about being a part of a consortium or a partnership. It's so great to hear about the academic benefits, about the social benefits, um, also just the food options too. I feel like I would definitely have enjoyed that as well if I was a part of a consortium, and I definitely can see why students would rave about that. So the next question, as we're talking about students and thinking about their college fit and what type of institutions they're thinking about when they're considering the colleges they're going to apply to and potentially rank through our process, could you speak about what types of students would really thrive at your institution and what types of students typically enjoy being a part of a consortium or a partnership? And to start us off, Ruby, do you mind kicking us off? Sure. I think with Barnard and Columbia, because literally we're in the same location, um, we are very different sizes. I think that's certainly a consideration for students to think about. Additionally, at Barnard, we are a women's college. And so we are students are engaging in an identity conscious space. And so is that something that a student is excited to engage in? Is I think a real a significant consideration for students? Yes, we do share a lot of resources with Columbia. And yes, there is a lot of overlap, but we are very distinctly a women's college experience, where as I mentioned before, the voices and pr uh, perspectives of women are going to be elevated, whether you are studying gender studies, whether you are studying neuroscience, physics, political science, psychology, whatever it may be, it is going to be through that identity conscious lens. And so is a student exciting and willing to in, 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 engage in that kind of thinking? I think beyond that too, um, what really brings the Barnard community together is that social justice is not just important to the Barnard community. It's why we exist as a college. Uh, the idea of starting a college for women um, when there weren't other opportunities. And so social justice is such an uh, such a critical part to the Barnard identity. And I think that that is also something that our students care deeply about. They want, they see problems in this world and they want to be the ones leading those solutions. And I think uh, for our students, that's really what ties the community together. But beyond that, I also love that there's no typical Barnard student. I love that students are taking advantage of so many different things. And I think they're drawn to New York City because they see so many sources of inspiration, whether they are interested in social justice, activism, they're interested in the sciences, they're interested in medicine, dance, whatever it may be, they see New York City as this place where they will be inspired and challenged. Um, and being able to be surrounded by people from all over the world, certainly within Barnard and Columbia, but also within the city itself. And so, I think for our students, an ideal fit is somebody who is eager to take advantage of all those opportunities. And I think that can be said of any college with a consortium. There's a lot in front of you. And so um, the kind of student who's excited to lean into all of that. If I can go next. Um, I think Amherst students are very, very intersectional and very interested in a lot of different things that might not traditionally go together. Uh, something that I haven't talked about very much because it's not really the subject of this talk, um, but a really important part of our academics is our open curriculum where we have no general education or um, core curriculum requirements. So students show up on campus and with the help of an advisor really craft the schedule every semester of whatever classes they wanna take across any department um, under really any circumstances. And then within the five college consortium at any school, um, which opens your path up to about like um, 8,000 courses in total. So there's just a lot, a lot of options. And uh, Amherst really attracts students who are willing to take charge of their education and then take a somewhat different path, a path that probably no one has ever taken before, um, majoring in things that are completely different or doing a pre-med program, but majoring in philosophy or going to law school, but majoring in neuroscience that wouldn't, nobody would actually expect of you coming in. And maybe you don't even know yourself, um, but through your semester at Amherst, you figure out along the way. So students who are ready to take control of what their education looks like, but also maybe have no idea what they want and are ready to experiment with some things that they didn't get to try in high school. Uh, I would say at CMC, um, we are very much kind of known as like the pre-professional liberal arts uh, institution. And so um, typically at liberal arts colleges, you kind of get this sense of like learning for the sake of learning, uh, which it's awesome and has value. Uh, at CMC, though, uh, our unofficial model is learning for the sake of doing. And so we want our students to be able to, you know, take 
what they learn in the classroom and actually apply it to real life, real world situations while they're at CMC, uh, not after they leave CMC. And so um, students that are, you know, very kind of forward thinking about what uh, they want to do uh, after um, CMC are, are, are going to be uh, great fits. Uh, also, you know, a part of our, our mission, again, is responsible uh, leadership. And with responsible leadership, you know, comes the ability to be able to effectively communicate with others, um, the ability to have, a, you know, a civil discourse uh, with, with folks. And uh, a lot of times uh, it, it's with people that don't always agree with you. Uh, and so being able to have uh, those, uh, what may be difficult uh, conversations is, is a big part of a CMC uh, experience uh, here at the college. Uh, and then I think one thing that is uh, kind of across the board, a, a great fit just with the, the liberal arts, as well as um, the consortium feel is um, students that have varied interests, right? Um, students that have interests, you know, they may have an interest in public policy, but they also have an interest in, you know, the arts, uh, or they have an interest in, you know, economics, but they're also, you know, interested in psychology uh, and how those things intersect. And so uh, we, we see that, you know, students uh, have very kind of academic interests and it caters itself very nicely to uh, the consortium uh, because they are able to, you know, add so many different uh, ingredients uh, to their academic uh, experiences uh, at the five C's uh, or the Claremont colleges, as well as, you know, the other consortiums that are represented uh, as well. Thank you all for sharing what types of students would thrive at your institutions and how really there isn't one ideal student who would fit at any one partner college. And I think especially in a consortium model, I think one of the benefits is that they will have access to those other institutions. And even if you're the right fit for your home institution, that means you still have, you can take from those other institutions too. So I think as students are thinking about fit and what types of schools they should rank or apply to, I think looking into schools with partnerships and consortiums can really allow you to have the best of both worlds. So the next question that I have that actually is coming from the Q&A, which I think really fits well into the conversation. And Jerry, you were just addressing this, thinking about students who are looking forward and thinking about what they're going to do after graduation. For our population of students, many first-generation and low-income students are highly attuned to what am I going to do after graduation? How am I going to take what I learned at this institution to help set me up for success afterwards? So I think it'd be really great to hear about the professional development or the alumni network and how being a part of a partnership or consortium institution is a unique advantage for a student. So to start us off, um, Nathan, do you mind kicking us off with that one? Yeah, sure. So Amherst has a career center called the, the Loeb Center for Career Exploration that is phenomenal um, and they are super, super well connected to our alumni network. Um, our alumni are always super happy to help out Amherst students during the pandemic. We did this campaign called Employ a Mammoth, because the mammoth is our mascot, where a bunch of a bunch of Amherst students had their summer internships fall through because they were canceled because of the pandemic. And we just sent out an email blast to the alumni network saying, hey, if you have any space in your office, like virtually uh, to help out an Amherst student have something to do over the summer. And within about two days, we had about 80 postings for jobs uh, for students. And so I think kind of going off of what Jerry was saying a little bit, there is this idea that Amherst is a small liberal arts college is, is about learning for learning's sake and it is about exploration. And I don't think we have that pre-professional vibe where every time you sign up for a class, you're thinking about how it's gonna look on a resume or something like that. But we also have a really good reputation for preparing students for things that are happening beyond Amherst and talking to first-gen low-income students that's often very much right at the forefront of their mind. So Amherst is the number three feeder school to law school in the entire country when calculated for per capita uh, students. Um, we are above Harvard, who is number four. Um, and we also have, we have an 80% med school acceptance rate, which is about double the country average. And it's even more than double for uh, students of color and first gen students. So those are more easier to track numbers than some other things that you might be thinking of doing as a career because they are grad school programs. Um, but it really is like 
the the Amherst Alumni Network and the Amherst name um, can get you very, very far moving out past college, um, if that's something that you're looking at, which it probably is. I'm also happy to speak to that, that with uh, the Barnard and Columbia alum alumni networks, they're are incredibly strong. And I think for many, many do choose to remain in New York City, whether that's professionally or pursuing graduate opportunities. Uh, when we look at where our Barnard students are continuing on to graduate school, there are many who are continuing on at Columbia. And I think that's a testament to how much our students have really enjoyed being in the Morningside Heights neighborhood in Manhattan, being in New York City, um, but specifically being a part of the Barnard Columbia community. And so it's a very popular destination for law school, medical school, business school, um, for many of our students, either immediately after graduation or after working for a few years and then applying to, to graduate school. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that are shared professionally during the college years. And so um, one example I can give you is that Columbia has a number of global centers worldwide where um, throughout the pandemic, students who were learning virtually around the world could go to those global centers. Um, both Barnard and Columbia students were taking advantage of resources there. But even now, as students are studying abroad in different countries, students can avail of the resources of the Columbia Global Center, regardless of whether they are a Barnard or Columbia student. For our international students who are seeking jobs outside of the US, um, the Columbia Global Center provides a lot of connections to local uh, alums around the world. And, and that's something our students can avail of too. Um, you know, Even if they are just studying abroad for a semester, then that's their experience living abroad, being able to connect with internship opportunities while they're living abroad. Um, within the U.S. too, I mean, for our students, um, even just in New York City, our students frequently at Barnard and Columbia will take what we call like a little field trip downtown to, um, you know, to Wall Street or to different tech companies that are based in New York City, um, being able to kind of see firsthand Barnard and Columbia Columbia alums at work. Um, and Barney, Barnard and Columbia alums love to hire other Barnard and Columbia alums. And so there's definitely a lot of networking, um, not just in our in New York City in our backyard, but truly around the world. And our students um, really do see all the benefits of that. So yeah, um, because we are kind of that pre-professional liberal arts institution, uh, this is big for us uh, every summer. Uh, CMCers are all over the country. Um, they're in New York. Uh, they're in San Francisco. Uh, they're uh, sometimes abroad, uh, and they're doing these wonderful uh, internship uh, opportunities through our Saul Center for Student Opportunities. Uh, and in many cases, uh, these opportunities are actually uh, funded uh, through special funding that we provide uh, for students to do that. And so if a student gets an internship that is unpaid or underpaid, uh, CMC will actually provide that student uh, that student with a stipend to be able to complete that internship wherever it may be, and so they'll do a cost analysis and figure out how much you need to successfully do it, uh, and that uh, that funding is going to pay for your travel as well as your living arrangements uh, while you are completing uh, that internship. Um, we also have some awesome domestic programs as well, uh, which are semester long uh, internships opportunities. And so we have a Washington, D.C. Um, program for students that are typically interested in uh, government, public policy, or international relations, uh, which is very popular. And you essentially work uh, 40 hours a week, a full-time job. And then we have instructors uh, there to, you know, for you to do your classes on the weekends and the evenings so you can still graduate uh, in four years while getting full-time work experience uh, as a student. Um, there, there's, you know, study abroad uh, options that involve that as well. Uh, and then I think as well as what was shared uh, earlier, um, any of the, you know, uh, recruitment uh, events that are happening for any of the five C's, uh, the Claremont Colleges, uh, any students from the colleges can attend uh, those events. And so uh, it's not just open to uh, that college. And so you have the opportunity uh, to be in front of employers, uh, maybe multiple times uh, during the year uh, to, to speak with them. And so we want to make sure that our students are equipped with the skills and the experiences necessary to be successful after CMC, which is why 85% uh, of our students uh, that graduate actually go directly into the workforce. Uh, right after graduation, 
Uh, and it's not because they couldn't get into graduate or professional school. Uh, what it really comes down to is that they're just ready uh, to work professionally. Uh, and many of those students, if it is required, uh, they will go to you know graduate or professional school after working for a couple of years. So that's a really big uh, thing for us at CMC. Thank you all for speaking about your individual campuses as well as your consortiums and how you're preparing your students to succeed after graduation and to really thrive um, afterwards. And the last question that I'm going to ask before we open it up to the live student Q&A. So for all the students who are listening, please start posting more questions. I see some really great ones and we're going to try and keep the focus on consortiums and partnerships. So let's ask more questions about those as well. So the last question that I have is one of the common questions that students ask about consortiums is whether they will graduate with degrees from all institutions involved or just from one institution. So Ruby, I know you addressed this earlier, but Nathan and Jerry, uh, would you like to address that question? And Ruby, if there's anything additional you want to add about Barnard in particular with that graduation uh, aspect, uh, we'd love to hear it. Uh, so at CMC, uh, you are going to graduate with a CMC degree. Uh, even if you do what we call an off-campus major, uh, you will still graduate with a CMC degree. Uh, and so uh, it, it's awesome. The majority of your classes are going to be taken at CMC, regardless of if you are you know, taking classes at the other colleges or even doing a major at the other colleges, because typically our students' curriculums are, are broken up into thirds. Uh, where one third is their general education courses, one third is their uh, major courses, and then the other third is their elective courses. And so you will still graduate with a degree from um, CMC, not from another institution, even if you do an off-campus major. Yeah, so ours is the same way. Our campuses are very much distinct. If you attend Amherst College, you will graduate with an Amherst College degree, even if you end up taking half of your classes at Smith, uh, which would be pretty unusual. Most of our students stick around for the majority of their classes. Um, but likewise, if a Hampshire College student took every single one of their courses at Amherst College, they would still graduate with a degree from Hampshire College. So um, you have a lot of freedom, but the end result is always going to be the degree with your major on it from Amherst College. I mentioned before that Barnard students graduate with a diploma that reads uh, that they're a graduate of Barnard College of Columbia University and that degree is conferred by both institutions, conferred by the presidents of both institutions as well and students are participating in Barnard graduation so well, Barnard College commencement as well as the Columbia University wide commencement where you see all of the Columbia undergraduate schools as well as the Columbia graduate schools, the Columbia Law School, Business School, Medical School, um, School of Journalism, all of that is, is showing up for the big university commencement and Barnard students are very much at that those exercises as well um, but for our students you know I think it this is sort of regardless of whether or not they you know how much time they spent on either campus too and so for some students I saw the question showing up in the Q&A about restrictions on how many classes that you can take within the Barnard Columbia uh, consortium there really isn't a restriction I think it really depends on the individual student some might be pursue a Barnard student might be pursuing a major at Columbia a Columbia student might be pursuing a major at Barnard so that might inherently dictate how much time they're spending at each respective campus. We also have a distinct curricula, and so Columbia has a core curriculum, Barnard has what we call our foundations curriculum. Students are expected to complete their curriculum, most of which they are completing at their home institution. Um, but beyond that, there's really no restriction. And so sometimes a student, the registration process is actually the same. Sometimes a student is signing up for a course because they're they're intrigued by the topic, they're intrigued by the faculty member. Barnard faculty are um, tenured at both Barnard and Columbia. They're researching for both, they're, they're, they're uh, teaching for both. And so sometimes a student isn't even aware which institution where the class will be hosted. It's really a function of, well, what subject is it or what course might it be? And, oh, I'm interested. And uh, it just happens to be that the class is being offered in a Barnard classroom or a Columbia classroom um, by function of space sometimes. And so it is that intertwined um, between Barnard and Columbia. Thank you all for addressing how the graduation and degree works at your institutions. And Ruby, that actually was the first question that I was going to ask about limitations on classes between uh, your partnerships and your consortium. So Nathan and Jerry, is there anything that you want to add in terms of your own curriculum and how that interacts uh, with the other institutions you partner with and how students fulfill their requirements if they have requirements? Yeah, so I, I can start with that. Um, so I will say that it's 
our policy is an Amherst policy. So I mentioned a Hampshire student taking all of their classes at Amherst. That is possible. Under Hampshire policy, there is no limit on the number of classes you can take through the five college consortium. So each of our schools have different policies. Uh, for Amherst, the policy is that none of your classes in your first semester can be at one of the other four colleges. So for the first semester, we're just trying to get your feet under you, get used to what Amherst is like, meet people, um, and you stay relatively on our campus. And then after that, you can take up to half of your classes, which typically is two classes a semester, at one of the other five colleges or other four colleges. Um, that's pretty unusual. The statistic for us is that about 50% of Amherst students will take a class at one of the other four colleges during their time at Amherst. So that's not massively significant. There are a good portion of Amherst students that are only going to take Amherst college courses during their time here. Um, it's it's pretty hard to avoid the five college consortium in the sense that Amherst is more of a destination school than it is sending people out. So there will be other five college students in in your classes. Um, but yeah, those are the limitations. So half your courses, I don't I don't I'm not sure anyone has ever hit that and run into that as a problem. But that is technically the limitation. And uh, we do have some limitations. I mean, I think for us, it's kind of a common sense approach in in terms of. Um, Typically for off-campus majors uh, and even some of the classes, uh, you really uh, want to take, you know, a, a class or you have access really to classes that are not offered at your home institution. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure that you're able to do something different that you wouldn't be able to get uh, at CMC. And definitely for someone doing an off-campus major, uh, you know, you have to be able, it definitely has to be a major that we do not offer uh, at, Clair uh, at Claremont McKenna. And so there are some limitations within that. Uh, and then I would say along with like the kind of common sense approach to the limitations with courses is that, um, you know, you can't be, let's say, a literature major at CMC and just enroll in any engineering class at Harvey Mudd. Um, and so that's not the way that it's going to work. There, there's prerequisites and things that you, you know, need to meet definitely for certain classes. And so what happens is when students go in to register for their courses uh, at CMC, uh, they can also see all of the courses that are open and available to them uh, at the other colleges and register just the same way that they would a regular CMC class. The only restrictions are going to be for those classes that require, um, you know, prerequisites in order to, you know, be met before you can get into those classes. And so it, there is a lot of freedom, but it is very much so with a, a common sense uh, approach to make sure that students are going, going to do well uh, in the classes that they're actually taking. Thank you all for addressing how the curriculum requirements work and how the selecting for classes operates between each of your institutions and how it works within a partnership and a consortium. So we do have time for a few of the other student questions. And then to wrap up the panel, each of our panelists is just going to share a quick uh, final thought or word of wisdom with all of our students here today. So the next question that I saw that I actually thought was a really interesting one, and I think it'd be really great to hear your thoughts on is what new collaborative opportunities do you foresee arising from your university consortium or partnership that could drive innovation and enhance the academic experience for students across your member institutions? So are there any new developments or things that are happening between your institutions or within the partnership that uh, you would like to share in terms of academic innovation or overall innovation for the student experience? I can, I can start with that, which is that uh, this is something that like some students will be really into and then professors are really into which is that we share a lot of uh, lab space and machinery with the University of Massachusetts Amherst um, which they bought uh, their geology department recently bought a really really fancy electron microscope um, that our professors although they have large amounts of funding one professor asking for a million dollar machine typically won't get across budgetary committee um, but they can just drive the five minutes over to UMass and borrow that one so there's a lot of students that do a lot of research with Amherst professors but at lab facilities at some of the other colleges and then it means that we don't have to duplicate and all invest in the exact same machines we can just oh oh yeah Smith has one of those and it 
really broadens your resources of what you can do with those more STEM oriented type stuff. Um, because if you're just all sharing resources and all sharing laboratory space and technology, um, you can really do a whole lot more stuff. So our professors and our students who are doing STEM research very, very much appreciate that. And it's a, a big draw, um, especially in the last decade and moving forward into the future. Uh, I would say for uh, for CMC. So uh, one thing is that uh, when it comes to science and sciences uh, at Claremont McKenna College, uh, that's getting ready to uh, change uh, somewhat. And so uh, in the past, we've actually uh, shared a science department, the CAC science uh, department, and it's been a shared resource with Scripps and Pitzer and CMC. Um, but CMC, we're actually starting our own integrated sciences um, department uh, with a focus in three main areas, uh, health, uh, the brain, and the planet or the environment. Uh, and so uh, with that, um, students are going to be able to, you know, look at those different areas, but really with a focus on the practical application of the sciences uh, using, you know, other studies. And so one of our first classes in that department is called the Codes of Life, where it's going to look at, you know, uh, biology, um, but really using computer science skills. So you'll be able to, you know, map out the human genome using, you know, computer science, uh, really to be able to, again, uh, practically apply biology in a way that's going to be uh, beneficial, hopefully, uh, for the world. And I can imagine as we are developing out that new uh, science department, that it is going to be a, a benefit for the other colleges as well, uh, as I can imagine students definitely taking classes uh, in the integrated uh, sciences, as well as CMCers continuing to be able to have access uh, to the Keck Science Department uh, courses, uh, you know, through just taking classes or even potentially an off-campus uh, major as well. So that's something new and innovative that's happening at CMC. Research is definitely also, uh, there's a lot of intersection there, a lot of shared opportunities. And so since others talked about research, I wanted to point to something a little bit different that um, we also have what we call at Barnard our four plus one programs, which through a four plus one program, which is referring to four years plus an additional year, essentially in five years, what a, a Barnard student could do is graduate from Barnard with a bachelor's degree from Barnard and a master's degree from Columbia University. And so um, that is a collaboration. It's not brand new. We've implemented it a few years back, but it's definitely gaining popularity. Um, to give you an example, we have a wonderful four plus one program in public health where a student can major in any discipline at Barnard and then apply um, to a, the four plus one program where they would then be earning a master's of public health from the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Um, and so in a five-year period coming out with two degrees, students are able to do that in a wide variety of subject areas, things like engineering, there are different social sciences. Um, there are lots of different opportunities to really think about continuing your education beyond your undergraduate in just in that short five year span. Um, and we're able to offer that because of our, our close ties to Columbia. Those are all such fantastic innovations and opportunities that are available for students as a part of this consortium and partnership experience. So unfortunately, we are approaching time. So I wanted to give each of the panelists the opportunity to just give a quick final thought or word of wisdom for our students as they're researching their your institutions or other institutions within the QuestBridge partnership that are a part of a partnership or consortium. And then I just have some final thoughts that I would like to share about logistics. Nathan, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I guess I would say that, um, you know, even though my college application season is uh, pretty far behind me at this point, um, that I know it's incredibly overwhelming and you're all probably very stressed out and uh, concerned, um, but that it's, it's going to turn out okay. And I think all of you are going to end up at a school that you love and has a lot of really good resources to offer you. Um, kind of regardless of, of what school that is. And that's, I think, my real takeaway from the consortium experience at Amherst is that there are a lot of students going to a lot of very different colleges and universities across the country, and they're all really enjoying themselves and having a great time and learning a lot of really interesting stuff. So uh, stick with it. 
I would say all of you are already on the right path by coming to sessions like this, where you are taking the time to get to know as many different institutions as possible. I see students are asking some very nuanced questions as well about the clusters match process. So all of you are already doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing in terms of getting to know lots of different colleges and then having that reflection as to what college fits what you need, recognizing that there are wonderful partners within the Questbridge organization, but recognizing that each college partner offers something a little bit different. Um, we happen to be the colleges that offer a different consortia agreements. There are others as well. Um, and maybe, you know, that affords you a lot of opportunities or perhaps something you're looking for something a little bit different. So I think taking the time to continue to get to know lots of colleges, keep your options open and take the time to reflect. And you're all doing that um, already in August. So you're already, you're already doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Enjoy the journey. Uh, it's, it's stressful. Uh, I know there's a lot of things coming at you right now, but uh, you know, take time to just, you know, enjoy how exciting it is to have all of these different options uh, available to you at this point. And um, just realize there, there's no right or wrong way, I think, to do higher education. Like, you know, you, you, you can make the best uh, of any situation. Uh, and I believe you all are, you know, talented enough to make the best of any institution uh, that, that you end up at, and you're probably gonna make that place better for it. Uh, and so just enjoy the journey, enjoy uh, the process and uh, have fun. Thank you all so much for sharing that. And that is the end of our panel. I wanna give a huge shout out to all of our panelists for their wonderful insights they've provided about their institutions and the cross campus opportunities they provide. If you want to continue learning about more about all 50 of our college partners, including those who are here with us today and the other partners they talked about in their consortium and partnership, I encourage you to check out our website. You can also view a recording of this webinar and the others in the Meet Our College series on our YouTube channel. And in case you missed our webinar earlier this month, join us for How to Earn a Full Ride, where we'll cover the National College Match and the benefits of applying to college through QuestBridge. And you can register for that on our website. But I want to thank all of our attendees. I want to thank our panelists. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.